Okay, I think we are ready to begin. Greetings again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Meyer Simiatiki at the Young Workers' Rights Hub at X University in downtown Toronto, a school formerly known by another name that is now under review. We begin with an acknowledgement of the land we occupy and what we owe its first peoples. Canadians live on Indigenous land. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. Its first inhabitants were Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee. Recent events, however, have brought us horrific reminder of the devastating impact colonialism has had on Indigenous children, families, and communities in this country. I'm referring, of course, to the discovery of almost 1,000 1,000 unmarked graves on the sites of two Indian residential schools in Western Canada. And we know these two schools were not isolated cases. Many, many deaths of children happened at residential schools across Canada. We need to acknowledge the damage and wrongs that settler society has inflicted on Indigenous peoples, we need concrete action that matches our responsibility for atrocities done in Canada's name. I urge myself, I urge all of us to play a part in advancing justice for Indigenous nations and peoples. Let's each find our own way of contributing to that cause and goal. And now on to our topic for today and our speaker. These are tough times for young workers in Canada. They have the highest unemployment rate of any age cohort. And when they do find work, they can often be vulnerable to a range of problems on the job. So can unions help young workers? That's our topic today. And we couldn't have a better presenter. Natalie Vengel is a national representative with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union or UFCW for short. Natalie joined the union at a young age, and her union is a leader in organizing young workers. The UFCW, for the record, is one of Canada's largest unions with 250,000 members, and no union has a higher percentage of youth among its members. Over 40% of UFCW members are under 30 years of age. It's a youth-driven union. That puts the UFCW in the forefront of promoting young workers' rights. So we're about to explore the connection between unions and youth. Our format will be informal and conversational. A student leader of our Young Workers' Rights Hub, Giselle Girardo, will be joining me now in conversation with Natalie Vengel. We'll chat for 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions from you, our audience. So at any point, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat box below, and we'll make sure to put them to uh, Natalie. Uh, we will be going till uh, about five o'clock or so. Um, uh, so fasten your seatbelts, lots of ground to cover. This session is being recorded and all participants should be muted. Natalie Vel uh, Vengel, welcome back to uh, the Young Workers' Rights Hub and our webinar series. Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you so much, Giselle, for inviting me and putting all this together and all the folks at Ryerson University for inviting UFCW Canada and putting these very important and exciting webinars together. And I said welcome back because, of course, uh, uh, you got our series started uh, um, uh, five weeks ago, and we purposely pl uh, wanted you to return as our, as our uh, uh, final presenter. So uh, um, Giselle and I will take turns asking you questions, uh, Natalie, and, and I'm going to begin by asking you about that that fact and bit of information I provided in, in the outset of, of what a high proportion of UFCW members are young, are youth. What's the secret of the UFCW success in organizing young workers? That is a very good, that is a very good question, Meyer. I think there's a combination of factors when it comes to the, the, the success of organizing your workers. So the first thing, and, and, and I think as, as young workers, we need to take in consideration is that young workers are organizing 
more than ever before. Why? Because the economic conditions that we're living, the times that we're living, uh, are, and the precarious employment that we are facing as a generation um, are pushing us to, to find secure ways of a steady income, financial stability, and job security. Job security is as important as, you, uh, as, as it is important for youth as for any other worker in Canada. Um, I also I also think that when it comes to um, organizing, as you said, we have a large demographic of young workers that's very attractive as a young workers, knowing that there there you know uh, that there are unions that have a large demographic because you feel that connection immediately to 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 being or being part of a of a union that it, that has a large um, constituency and membership of young workers. Uh, I would also say the media exposure that the union tries uh, to have to connect with young workers, you know, the different media tools, the online engagement through social media, webinars, we're trying to adapt to uh, what young workers are utilizing. You can call it social media, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, you call it. We're trying to, to adapt texting more than calling on the phone. I mean, a lot of us don't appreciate being on the phone for like an hour. We text, we like it, we adapt. So I think there's a bunch of factors together, but definitely I would say the number one factor is, listen, young workers are organizing, are more aware of their rights today, and they're organizing more than ever before. And just to follow up quickly on that, uh, Natalie, uh, is there any pattern to the kinds of specific issues or problems that young workers are facing on the job? Do you see any pattern there? Well, job security, I would say that one of the main reasons why young workers want a young union is respect. Absolutely, job security. Um, um, young workers know how they should be treated on the job, what their rights are, and they know when their rights are respected. So they come for, they, they call a union when, when things are not going right at work. I also would say that having job security creates, uh, especially for us uh, young workers who choose to go to university, who are coming out of university with enormous debt amount, having job security means that we have that steady income that we know we can count on, steady hours, the job protection, the job hour, the, the, the scheduled protections that we need in order to, to, to pay for all our, our, our financial commitments. So these are, kind of the patterns, but I would say the number one would be respect and job security. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Giselle, over to you. Thank you, Natalie and Meyer. Uh, the next question is, I think we're all interested in learning more about you and how you got to this position. So what led you to join and become active in a union? Thank you so much, Giselle. Um, so I, when I was in university, I studied political science and human rights at York University. And I, I opened a food bank um, and, 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 and I was very interested in food security and, uh, and everything that had to do with food systems. At the same time, when I was in university, I was the president of the same group, which is the Students Against Migrant Exploitation Group at York University, which was a initiative by UFCW. So I was very connected to um, the issues regarding migrant agricultural workers in Canada and food security. So that really was the, 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 the footsteps for me to, to, to become active in the labor movement. And, um, you know, through the eyes of migrant workers, what was going on in Canada, the rights of migrant workers not being respected at work and, 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 and food systems, um, I, I thought this was a great opportunity for me to, to, to make a change, a sustainable change. Thank you for that, Natalie. Um, and I know that there are, as a follow up, there's a lot of undergrad in the audience and in the future watching this. Um, what is your advice for those who are interested in making their own student group um, to advocate for other people's rights? You know what, sometimes uh, I, I really find it like it's, it's about what, what, what drives you. A lot of folks are interested in environmental law or environmental changes. Some of them are interested in legislation. So start talking to people alike. So at universities, the amazing thing about universities, there's, there's pretty much a group for a lot of activism. And professors are a great allies. They're great allies when it comes to, to finding those, those groups and 
based on their research and, and all the work they do, they can really connect you with students alike and, and start forming groups. I would also suggest that whichever activism, whichever uh, path students want to take or want to advocate uh, about, reach out to organizations. You know, um, the food bank, for example, uh, when I op opened the food bank, I needed some reference letters and the union helped me out. I, I got a letter from the union supporting my initiative. So there are a bunch of not only unions, but not-for-profit organizations or, or many organizations in the city, community-based organizations that will be very happy to support student-led initiatives and probably are like-minded. So don't be, don't be afraid of reaching out. You, you, will be, you will find so many open doors in the community. The community is the number one place you will find support for sure. Natalie, from, from, Natalie from, from your experience um, representing and leading and working with so many young, uh, young workers, um, what would you say is like, what are the main differences for a young worker in belonging to a union or not belong versus not belonging to a union? What, what kind of advantages or disadvantages come along for young people with belonging to a union? So, you know what, I, I think I, I, I really touch upon on some of them, but the number one is job security, you know, and, and, and if we connect job security with Matt, with, 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 the, with the issues that workers are facing today, means, you know, with all the tuition prices going up, job security means, again, steady income. Um, you know, uh, when, when, work, when young workers are in a union, I don't know if you've heard or if you've, you've listened to some of the issues that young workers are facing as well is, you know, it's pharma care, access to pharma care and dental, dental care. Um, you know, when, when workers in unions, they have the ability to negotiate and bargain for improved working conditions. And that means uh, they, workers gain the legal right to negotiate for um, pharma care, for a drug plan, a benefit plan. And that, you know, and that comes with being in a union, with being organized. So um, unions offer, a, and, and, and I'm speaking most obviously about UFCW, but unions support young workers in general. And, and, and young workers at UFCW have a variety of scholarships, for example, that are available to them and their family when they're, they're, when they're um, taking a post-secondary education course and a variety of courses online, education platforms. So I think that being in a union um, provides a sense of belonging, a sense of security. Unions advocate on behalf of young workers on issues that matter to them. So having that legal and togetherness aspect uh, as a young worker feels feels safe, feels empowered, and feels it feels protected. So I would say that those are the main mm -hmm. the main um, components. Natalie, can you give us a quick identification of, of you mentioned uh, the union plays a role in advocating for issues related to youth, and I guess that advocacy can be with employers, but it certainly also is often with government. Can you give us examples of some of the issues that that UFCW uh, currently or recently has advocated that would be of interest to young workers? Absolutely. We, we uh, you know, over the course of every year, we're always listening to young workers. We're always listening to our members and, and young workers who uh, wish to be organized uh, across Canada. So we've launched different campaigns like hashtag toss tuition free, uh, toss tuition fees or free education for all. Uh, we've lobbied and we continuously lobby the government at every level, provincial and federal, for issues like uh, free pharma care for young workers, um, uh, you know, tuition, tuition fees being removed. So these are some of the activism that we undergo all the time to ensure that workers, the young workers are heard at every level. And we always encourage young workers to participate in all, all campaigns that we have. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, yeah, it does, yeah. Our next question is, um, what are the misconceptions that young workers have about unions? Um, and for the other end, what are the misconceptions that unions have about the youth? 
So um, I would say I, I would say that misconceptions that young workers have about unions. Um, this this is a bit of maybe young workers and most workers have about unions. Um, you know, the first one is union dues. Union dues uh, is the main the main misconception. Where do the union dues go? Um, how much would it be? So there are a lot of misconceptions about me, uh, union dues. The another main misconception is not that not all workers can union unions. So there is an idea, a general idea, that only full time workers can union unions, and that's not true. Um, there is a, a, a misconception that unions are companies and not non for profit. Um, you know, the unions are. Are, are, are like corporations and, and not non-for-profit organizations, which they are. Um, there are issues of representation. You know, sometimes young workers feel like they're not necessarily going to be represented um, because they think as union members being older and not in, you know, in the, in the age or interested in representing people in their age, which is not true. Um, there's all, another very common misconception that unions are only for the public and construction trades and not necessarily for the private sector. So those are some of the misconceptions. And um, the misconceptions about unions have about youth. To be honest, I don't know if I'm gonna be biased with this answer, but our membership is 40%, um, you know, as, as Maya mentioned, it's 40% youth. So um, we're always trying to listen to our membership. So uh, misconceptions are something that in at the top of my head, I can I can think of I cannot think of. We're always listening to our members, uh, being activists, being you know if, if there are you know a lot of misconceptions about millennials and young workers and and Generation Z and Generation. In my experience, as a union representative, our members have proven that they are super activists, willing to go above and beyond for their co-workers and for young workers across the country, so. Hmm. Natalie, um, uh, others may or may not know, of course, when when your, your title of national representative uh, um, with UFCW, uh, that means that you are, you work for the union. Yeah, so your your full time position is now working working uh, uh, on behalf of the union to represent and provide support and services to your members. Are are there are there a lot of younger uh, um, uh, people like you who are in staff positions working for the union? Yes, yes, even younger than I am. Absolutely, yes. I think that um, as a union. And our leadership is very, very, very aware that the, you know, that the membership is constantly changing. We have a lot of young workers um, uh, in the union, uh, and most of the young workers in the union are also um, workers of color, racialized minorities, which is super cool. Because you know what we want to make sure is that all members see a little bit of themselves in us that we represent them in every way possible. Mm. So yes, yes, yeah. very proud, very proud to say that. Mm. So I, I wanted now to ask you to, to tell us more about the process by which um, young workers become union members of UFCW or of, of any other union. And, and uh, 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 my understanding, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but please say more than what I will just outline, is that uh, 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 some people become union members by virtue of the job they get, that, that they, they get hired into, into a position and that position is part of a bargaining unit represented by a union. And so by virtue of having, they don't have to do anything to, to, to belong to a union. They are in the union because there is a union management relationship at the workplace where they were hired. Then the second category is those who are in a non-unionized workplace, but who decide they want to establish a union. So what are those two pathways to unionization like? Like how, how do people uh, uh, and young people in particular become union members? 
So I would say that the first thing is to ensure that um, folks know the difference between construction unions, public unions, and private sector unions. So the process of union union in different sectors is different. So UFCW is a private sector union. So I would explain how, uh, how the process would be for private sector unions. So essentially there are two ways. You either organize, you form a union by talking to your coworkers, signing union cards and voting for the union. That is the very, very short summarized way of bringing the union to your workplace. Of course, there's plenty of process, a, a, a bit more of a, a process for sure. Or if you happen to start working at an already organized bargaining unit or workplace, what does that mean? That means that the workplace has already been organized, is already being represented by a union, and then you start working then and are automatically covered by that collective agreement or union contract, and you're automatically a union member. So these are the two ways you can become a member in the private sector in Ontario. Yeah. Uh, Natalie, thank you for that. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded, uh, you know, there was a time when when, when I was, I, I'm now retired uh, from faculty at X University, but among the things I taught were, were labor studies, and I would touch on the law, the law and a, a, as you hinted, the there's a lot of legal language and and regulation around around unionization. I I I, I think for anyone with us who is uh, un, uncertain about an aspect of this, one thing I think that's important for everyone to recognize is. Um, uh, a union gets established only if it wins a democratic majority of workers who express in a secret ballot that they want to establish a new union. That, that a union gets established because it passes a democracy test. It gets more than 50% of votes cast uh, of fellow employees who decide we'd rather be represented by a union than not have a union. So, um, you know, to go back to the misconception issue, some people, you know, there's so little awareness or teaching of workplace issues and labor rights that that I think it's important to emphasize that unions are, are arrive, uh, it, come into existence through a very democratic process. Yeah, so That's right. I, yeah, so uh, I, I, I just wanted to throw that editorial comment in uh, and remind myself that, yes, I once was a teacher. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Giselle, over to you. Thank you, Myra. Clearly, I can tell that you miss teaching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question is, um, what unions... What do unions do for women, BIPOC, disabled, and 2S LGBTQ plus young workers? One of the things that um, it's very important to talk when we talk about unionization is that unions, for example, help to close the uh, the wage gap, for example. You know, as, as women, we know that women, we make significantly less than our male counterparts doing this, the exact same job. When and that also happens, of course, with with those who are disproportionately affected, like such as, such as racialized women, and uh, people of color, uh, and members of the two us LGBTQ community and indigenous indigenous folks. So when when workers union union, that that wage gap is automatically removed because all workers, when you negotiate a collective agreement, all workers doing a specific um, task or duty or in a specific position, regardless, will have the same wage. So unions help to, to sort of close the wage gap because there's clarity and transparency in the negotiation process. Everyone is included and every, every worker is the same and should be treated the same in the legal aspect of the collective agreement and always. So that is one way that unions help uh, racialized folk and, bi and BIPOC folks into SLGBTQ. Also, when it comes to language and negotiations, unions really help, for example, members um, to, to, uh, to negotiate language uh, or anti-discrimination and anti-harassment at the workplace. So for folks who are being harassed for their gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, gender expression, unions really, really advocate 
to ensure that that doesn't take place at the workplace, that there's zero tolerance for such behavior. Participating in events uh, such as Pride and the different cultural events where our members take pride in participating in, unions participate in issues that are members, um, that, 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 that are important to our members. Um, I'm not sure if that's, that answered your question in a short way, I guess. No, I think yeah, it did. I, th uh, uh, I think very much, very much it did give us a flavor of, of some of the uh, particular um, uh, supports and resources that the union makes, uh, makes available to uh, different segments of its membership. Um, I want to ask you about um, something, um, you know, so widespread now in the economy that, you know, some people think uh, is even turning our economy upside down, and that's gig work. Um, so we had a session a couple of weeks back as part of our series looking at specific issues and problems that gig workers face. Um, I understand that UFCW is attempting to unionize gig workers. Can you tell us something about that campaign? Well, you, you were probably seeing that we've uh, tried to organize Uber drivers. If you go to our website, you will see um, that we're trying at, uh, to advocate and, 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 and at every level to ensure that gig workers are recognized as, as uh, not contractors, but actual workers. I think this is one of the biggest challenges. We know that in some other countries, gig workers, Uber drivers, and, and, and many other workers have, are actually considered what we will, uh, what, what, what the equivalent will be here as, you know, as, as part of the, the Employment Standards Act or, or, or workers having an employment relationship with these gig companies. And that is, uh, this is, there's an ongoing effort that UFCW has to ensure that, um, you know, that all workers, they serve the same protections and that, and that includes the right to unionize and have all the protections of the law and eliminate the precarity of, uh, of gig workers. And uh, um, how would you say, uh, you know, the, the effort to unionize that really uh, almost brand new erupting, disrupting um, uh, way of work is going? It is challenging. It is challenging, but um, listen, the workers are the ones who want to organize. And we are always going to support the workers first and their health and safety and their and, and their conditions of work. So even though it has its challenges with all, you know, the labor movement and workers have always gone through different challenges. And this is one that we will I'm sure we'll, we'll come out of victorious because all workers deserve to be respected hmm. equally under the law. Natalie, thank you. And uh, just to let everyone know, we have two more um, question areas and then we will turn into an open uh, uh, discussion and uh, feel uh, and uh, uh, direct questions you may have to to Natalie. Uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pass on the last two question areas to Giselle. Over to you, Giselle. Thank you, Meyer. Um, so the next two questions are tough. Um, <laughs> so the next question is, what if someone gets in trouble for joining or belonging to a union? Yeah, that's part of one of the misconceptions, Giselle, actually. It's one of the many misconceptions, like, oh, what if I get in trouble? Like, is this legal? You know, it, it's, a com you know it's a common and very, very, very real fear. Um, and so the first thing that work young workers need to know is this is completely legal and completely confidential by law. So joining a union is your right by law and is confidential by law. You are not alone. So when you are in the process of joining a union, you have an organizer. You will have a group of organizers helping you out, answering any question, making sure that the employer is, you know, following their rights, that your rights are protected, and, and, and that there is a and if there is a violation of the rights or infringement of the rights on behalf of the employer, the union will have your back legally. So. Um, 
it, no workers by law should be intimidated or coerced for joining a union or for actively participating in joining a union. So know that there are uh, there are um, a number of, of, of uh, a number of rights that workers have under the Ontario Labor Relations Act, which is a legislation that it's part of the Ministry of Labor is a legislation that protects workers who are in the process of union a union or who are already unionized. There are a, num a number, a, a great number of uh, rights uh, that workers have and that are protected the second they start uh, participating in the union and those and, and the union's um, role is to ensure that, that you're protected, that all workers are protected the entire way. So if you get in trouble, you let us know, we'll help you out. That's a sure answer. <laughs> that is great to know. It's great to know that it's a misconception. Um, and our last prepared question is, what do unions need to be better at? Ooh, that is a question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I am thinking, you know, how can we be better at, at transmitting a message? How can we be better at connecting with folks all the time. You know, we have social media. We, we well, I mean, right now in the pandemic, we're gonna go out as much and we're trying to minimize contact. Where can we always go? What are the new places where young workers are, are organizing? You know, I think that um, we are always trying to reach as many young workers as we can. And we're always trying to find ways to connect. But I think that, um, the, the, the counter question to yours is, what can we do better? And, and folks who are here may, may, may be able to give me some answers to this. How can we be better connecting with, with all folks um, just to, 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 be, to be more approachable? Uh, what can we do better? I think that that kind of question goes back to you. I don't have the answer to do that. I, 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 we're trying, trust me, we're trying to adapt as much as we can. We're trying to do, we're trying to reach, we're trying to connect, but I, I don't know, I don't know an answer to that. I, I, I'm looking, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> well, let's see if uh, our, our participants have any thoughts or, or advice or suggestions uh, for you in that in that uh, vein. Uh, you've certainly given us a lot of information and uh, context for for thinking and maybe for some of us rethinking uh, uh, what the connection between unions and youth. So, um, I'm going to turn things over to Giselle to moderate the Q&A. Um, and I know a couple have come in. So Giselle, I think you can ask those. And then I'm going to live dangerously and suggest we're maybe we're an intimate enough group that once we're through the initial questions, if people want to unmute and, and uh, uh, ask questions, you know, we may get into a more conversational exchange. Uh, so we've got about uh, 20 to 25 more minutes still to go. So uh, we're in very good, um, very good timeline. Giselle, over to you. Thank you, Meyer. Um, so the first question, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from the chat. The first one is, does the UFCW have a position on Bill 21 in Quebec, which bars people who choose to visibly express a religious faith from holding certain jobs? I ask because young people in Quebec are now barred from certain careers if they choose to wear a turban, a hijab, et cetera. Um, thank you so much, Giselle. Brad, um, hmm. I will get back to you. If you leave me your email, I, I, I'm honest enough to, you know, I, I've, I've read about Bill, about Bill, Bill 21 in Quebec, not enough, and to have a, a, an accurate answer. But I can, if you leave me your email privately, if you wish to, I will I will look into that and get an answer for you. I'm being honest. Thank you for your honesty, Natalie. Um, the next question that we have is, what is the key to keeping momentum in a movement? Keeping momentum is, I think, one of the challenges thing, especially now that technology is is ever changing and our attention span is a little shorter to be honest, hence TikTok, you know, that's why TikTok is so popular. But I think momentum is a combination of things. So 
first of all, it is very important to remember, uh, to remind folks, what are we doing this in the first time, all the time. Constantly reminding people, why are we doing this? Okay, yeah, because this is, what, this is what's happening. This is the issues that we're trying to attack. The number two is communication. But communication takes different forms. We don't need to be on the phone 24 hours to maintain momentum. We can text. Something happens, you can text me. Um, um, there is an issue that a lot of people have. We can, create a, 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 um, we can create a chat on WhatsApp or Instagram and we can keep momentum that way. Something happens at work. We're over there texting. You can, you, you know, you can talk, to, to, talk to each other and in the chat and answer any questions. So I think that being very responsive and being reliable and liable at all the time, being available to answer any questions, knowing that at all the time that you're supported, it's the best way to keep momentum. You know, and, and making sure that everyone is engaged, right? It's not like, oh, you know, yes, I want to be part of a union. No, listen, you're going to be part of a union. Talk, let, let's talk about the issues that care that you wanna you wanna see improve. You wanna be you wanna be an activist. Let's do something to be to help you become an activist in in, in matters that in, in issues that matter to you. So it's it's about always finding that comfort and support in our group. I think it's a is a is is a key to keeping momentum. Thank you. I think it's very important to to always ask us, ask yourselves what we're doing this for. I think that's yes. very important. Um, the next question is, you mentioned that online engagement has been a way that you organize this. Was it, what is an effective way of online engagement that you have noticed uh, to voice out youth concerns? You know what? Um, during organizing campaigns, we've seen a lot of success on Instagram. I mean, I don't blame it. Instagram is a pretty, you know, it's a momentum keeper. And um, so workers who are in the process of organizing, uh, we've seen it in many campaigns. They start uh, creating their own Instagram accounts and they start posting things about, you know, whatever anti-union campaign is going on at work. Very courageous, very courageous, but it's a good way to maintain momentum. And then they invite folks from different, uh, you know, activists, friends and, 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 and unions to, to participate or, you know, they, uh, they also create chats and on WhatsApp, Facebook, TikTok, you call it. So I think that one of the successes has been from, you know, creating WhatsApp groups, uh, Facebook groups, Zoom meetings, Instagram, Instagram, they post stories, uh, misconceptions during the, the anti-union campaign. It's, it's pretty amazing how Instagram has been so helpful in organizing and dismantling anti-union campaigns and getting workers uh, interested in continuing momentum before they get to a vote. And even after a vote, they continue to use Instagram to demonstrate what the union has 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 done at the workplace. It's, it's really cool. Honestly, it's really, really cool. I think that's one perk of maybe uh, the pandemic is that we're all connected through social media more. That's right, um, that's right. <laughs> and the next question is, what do you see as the future of the labor movement? You know what? I, with pride, with a lot of pride, I say that the future of the labor movement is filled with young workers. The young workers continue to be the face of the labor movement. Every time um, a young worker calls and says, I'm ready to organize, and, I, and I'm having those conversations more and more and more, I'm like, yes. Finally, yes, we are aware of our of our rights. We 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 want to be respected at work, and I see a very diverse uh, labor movement, um, empowered youth and members of, of of racialized and BIPOC communities. That's how I envision the labor movement. Um, being empowered and I see more and more and more young workers um, being leaders at the workplace by the second day, by the second. Thank you for that. The next one is, as a recent graduate, I have had difficulties with finding a career path. And the more I come to these events, the more interested I get with employment, labor and workers' rights. Can you give me advice on a good next step for me to get in this career? So, I'm, I mean, I'm not a, a, a job advisor, but what I could, what what helped me, and I'm speaking on a personal, a personal note, 
it is it is difficult as a recent grad. We're struggling to find full time uh, full time job that has that provides a you know competitive wages, benefit packages, and hours. Um, something that helped me out, uh, but it's it's kind of a it has been volunteering and gaining experience through volunteering at the time. But the unfortunate part of volunteering is that it's not always paid or sufficiently paid. But through volunteering, building connections with folks was very helpful for me and my experience. Um, connecting or, or, or choosing organizations that have a common ground with your vision of what you want to achieve or where you want to work or what what really what really motivates you know what what, what really what what your passion is I think will be a very organic uh, place for you to build those relationships and and hopefully you will be able uh, to find a, a a good job. Thank you for that, Natalie. I think just learning more about your journey helps a lot. Um, the next question is, how can we encourage other young workers in learning more about rights? I know a lot of my friends who are interested, but, but some don't care. How can I let them know about the importance of knowing more about our workers' rights? You know what? Um, when I uh, talk to like my, my friends, siblings, or younger, I'm like, uh, hello, you know that tuition fees are going up. You know that um, you have the right to a so and so. Like having very normal conversations about what's going on at their workplace. A lot of them have part-time jobs, so you know having very organic conversations about issues that actually concern. Like, oh my God! So you know that my debt is going up. Um, having a summer job is not enough, or a part-time summer job is not enough. Why does it matter to know my rights? Because then I can just not be, you know, uh, fire on the spot. I know my, but I know my rights at work. I know I can organize to to secure my working conditions and improve my working conditions. Having that conversation and like, why is it important for young workers to know their rights so they're so they're respected and secured at work is essential. Talking about the issues that matter to us all the time, like. Uh, I would I would love to have benefits. I would love to have a better pay so I can pay off my debt faster. Issues like that will come into a conversation of, well, you you, you know you have your rights to a so and so and so, right? You you have the opportunity to change your condition. So, I think that's a very organic way of talking about it. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is a little interesting. What if our union is not advocating for their membership's concerns? What can we do? I cannot, I, again, I cannot speak on any other union. I can only speak about my union. But if you think that your union is not doing enough on issues that concern you, you are a member. You are the core of your union. So if you think there are issues that you would like your union to be advocating uh, more, talk to a union rep, talk to your local union, communicate. Uh, to your local union, what are the issues that concern you? Remember, as member, the union, you know, I always ask this question when I'm having Know Your Right session. I, I always ask people, do I look like the union? Do I, like, do I look like the union? They're like, ah, yeah, no. Like, the, the answer is very like, mm. I'm like, no, the union is you. The union, the union, there's no union without workers. So as a member, you're the core of the union. You are the core, the center, the heartbeat of the union. So if you feel that you that you that your the issues that you're look that you're concerned about are not being voiced at every level or not is not being advocated, voice it out. You're a union member. Voice it out at every level at your union, at your local union. Natalie, is it fair, is it is it fair to add to that that um that you know, uh, uh, unions are uh, democratic organizations. They have elected uh, leadership. That at a certain point, if one is dissatisfied with uh, the direction of the union uh, you belong to, um, there is at a certain point of time going to be an election where, uh, if you wish, you can 
put your name forward for any position within the union. So to your point about, uh, you know, the, the union is its members, uh, uh, the members also become union leaders. Uh, um, and, and so, you know, there is that opportunity presumably to take unions in a different, in, in, in a different direction. Uh, admittedly, it takes a lot of organizing, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of commitment, uh, maybe even a dose of courage. Uh, but there is that option of uh, challenging an elected leadership that you think is not sufficiently responsive. Well, I could say again, I'm only talking about the union I work for, Yeah, is that um, there, there are constitutions, each union has constitutions and there are democratic processes, the process of organizing, the process of voting a contract, the process of electing the union officials, everything is democratic. And there are absolute, there are many opportunities for, for union members to participate at every level too. Uh, again, I can only speak about my union and all unions, but yes, there are opportunities. For example, uh, our, our, our national president, Cole Minema at UFC Labu Canada, he was a member. Uh, he was a member uh, a member um, at, at a local union um, in out east. So these are all members of the union. Remember, all of you are the core of the union and have rights within the union. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, our next question is, um, I know that you talked about union dues briefly, but I stopped that for a moment. Where do union fees go? What does it do? Okay, that's a really, you know what? That's actually one of the main misconceptions that we, 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 we slightly touched upon about that, on that. So union dues are, are, first of all, are tax deductible. So, and the reason why they're tax deductible it's because the unions are non-for-profit organizations. They have charity status. So just like when you donate to any char uh, charitable organization, union dues have the same status as those charitable organizations. That's why you have a tax break or a tax, in, or, or the union dues are tax deductible. So union dues go to pay for services for the membership. So in, in you, you know, when we're talking about services, for example, union dues pay my salary as a union representative. So, you know, um, for representational negotiation of contracts in, at UFCW, all union dues must go to the membership in one way or another. So if there's union dues left or money left, they have to go back to the membership in one way or another or servicing our members. So unions have a variety of, of programs. We have, for example, scholarships, um, programs for our members and their families. We have a, a online educational platform called Web Campus at, at UFCW and members can take many, many courses for free. Some of them are accredited by some universities. So if members are going uh, to university or colleges, some wow. of those courses could, could go towards the tuition fees and they don't have to pay for those courses. So um, union dues pay for all membership related fees. So. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zach. Gives us a little bit more of an insight. Um, <clears throat> the next question that we have is, I'm just wondering, can a union be disbanded? Can a union be descended? Disbanded. Or, um, I'm sorry. Like, disbanded, like brought to an end. Yes, yes, yes. Can a union be disbanded? Well, if workers, there are, there has been times in many unions where locals uh, have merged and some small locals disappear, maybe. Um, unions can, uh, when workers decide not to be part of a union, they, they either stop working at a workplace that, you know, for many reasons they change career, they're not members of that union anymore. Um, again, if we go back to the, to the, to the main idea, there's no unions without workers. If there's no workers, there's no union. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. And I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah. Nat Natalie, if, if I can uh, jump in on one, uh, uh, with, with, with one 
point here. I, 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 I'm having a memory of uh, those lectures I gave all those years ago. Uh, you mentioned um, the uh, uh, Ontario Labor Relations Act, which is, a, as you said, a particular piece of legislation that sets out the ground rules for how you would go about or unionizing a non-unionized workplace, and it's highly technically regulated. Uh, within that, that legislation, there is a provision for decertifying a union, for a union uh, 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 because of the democratic vote of its members, basically legally being required to disband because its members no longer by a majority wish to be represented by that union. And I can toss in as a last thought here, uh, union decertifications are very, very rare and infrequent in Canada. It's a very rare occasion when workers decide, you know what, I'd rather not belong to a union. Uh, than belong to one. But yes, there is a procedure uh, uh, lay, laid out for that. That's right. So um, again, going back to the main point, workers want to join a union, right? And this is a democratic process. If the majority of workers want to join a union, they will bring the union. If the majority of workers don't want to be part of a union, they will not be, they, they will decertify from a union. So That's right. again, yeah, that is a democratic and a united process. Yeah. Again, this is the private sector. Other other conditions apply for different sectors. Yes, there are just like there is legislation during the certification process or organizing process or bringing or certifying a union as the collective bargaining um, representative or organization. There is also a decertifying process from the union if workers mm -hmm. decide to choose that path. Yeah. Giselle, can I jump in? I, I'm mindful that we're we're approaching the end of our timeline. I, I've had a, a, another question that that I'm really curious to add, to hear Natalie's thoughts on. Um, your union, uh, um, um, especially, has high representation of essential workers. And, and, and I'm thinking at this point, especially of uh, uh, supermarkets and grocery stores. So, so your union represents workers in some of the largest uh, supermarket chains in the country where we many of us go shopping. Um, so we're still into uh, uh, 16 months of COVID and your members have often, uh, uh, people doing uh, that work have often been praised as essential workers. Um, I'm, I'm curious fr from what you hear in your conversations, what has their experience of working through COVID been like? And I'm especially curious about the, the, the business of them getting uh, uh, essential service bonus pay for a certain period of time and then having that terminated. Uh, so what has that experience been like for your members? The, whole, the well, whole experience of working through COVID in supermarkets? Well, of course it is. It has been extremely difficult. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of expectation. There's a lot of risk that our members are taking every day to ensure that all of us have our essentials covered. So, you know, dealing with issues regarding mental health, physical health, um, um, all the recent exposures, um, all, 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 all the ever-changing information about the virus. Of course, it has, been, it has been a very, very, very difficult times for essential workers. And, you know, our union has nonstop from day one has advocated at every level, every province federally to ensure that all workers and also to the employers, but also at the, at the, at the governmental level that all workers receive premium pay. There are a number of programs across the country in different provinces that are providing 
uh, one-time bonuses for workers. Um, not in Alberta province, but we saw it here in Ontario temporarily. We had some of that. Alberta has some of it. And, you know, these are part of the advocacy that unions uh, push uh, to the government to, to ensure that the workers had uh, and have and continue to have essential pay and bonuses for all the work that they put and all the risks that they're taking. Also, providing um, providing and ensuring that there's a, a, a contact, um, I'm always staying in contact with employers to ensure that their health and safety is prioritized and ensuring that all protocols are being respected at the workplace to ensure that all workers all, at all times are protected, providing guidance, providing um, providing all sort of resources to our members, ensuring to ensure that they they know their rights at work, doing know their health and safety rights and and the protocols and the most up to date information for the health and safety while at work. Thank you for that, Natalie. Giselle, and we're probably into the home stretch now with maybe five minutes or so uh, still available to us. Okay, we just have two uh, two questions left. Okay. Um, I'm interested in potentially becoming a union leader. Do you have any advice for that? Are you considered hmm. a union leader? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm considered a union leader, but, um, but I, I like to see myself as an activist. Um, what I would say is that if you're interested in 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 in, in, uh, in pursuing a career in the new in, in the union or as an activist, I think the most important thing as a leader is to inspire and lead by example. So start, you know, working together uh, with with your coworkers or people alike to move forward issues that are important for them. You know, um, taking a lead in any actions, any campaigns, connecting with people alike to move forward and, 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 and convert, you know, ideas into actions, I think is one of the most important aspects of activism and leadership in, 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 any, in, in any aspect of our life. Um, Pick the various issues that are your top concerns and your coworker concerns. It's always a main thing. Advocate. When you see something that is not fair, talk about it. Do not be quiet. This is the time. You know, if COVID has taught us something, is that we have to prioritize our well being and our rights at the workplace all the time. So taking that stand will definitely you will definitely make you a natural leader everywhere. Everywhere. Thank you for that, Natalie. Um, and our last question is, how can I contact you if I have more questions about unions? <laughs> I like that question. I like that. <laughs> I really like that question. So I am going to drop my uh, my Twitter and my email. You can follow me. I'll definitely follow you back. I promise. Um, this is I'm going to I'm going to send you my email. You can you can email me anytime and I will be super duper happy to talk to you, text, whatever, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you do, you know, you <laughs> choose whatever you want. And then, yeah, I'm writing it down in the chat. There you go. Anytime, so, like 7-Eleven, 24-7, you can, you can email me anytime. So uh, uh, Natalie, you, you, you've, you've just obviously passed the test of yes, being uh, a union leader, yes, you are. Uh, you have inspired uh, people with us today to want to follow in your footsteps, want to do the kind of, um, work and uh, undertake the same commitments you do and to learn more from you. Uh, um, so I would say um, uh, you really are a great leader of 
uh, workers of the labor movement. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm remembering also what you had said about starting off with your first activism in the in food security and in a food bank that, um, you know, uh, your advice of, you know, follow your heart and issues that are meaningful to you. And don't be surprised if those issues also connect with unions and the labor movement and what the labor movement values and supports. Um, so Natalie, this has been uh, really, really terrific. Like uh, it has been informative, it has been inspiring. And, and um, Natalie, I'm just very, very grateful to you for um the time that you've given us today the time you gave us a month ago in the first session and in between you've been so encouraging about what we're trying to do at the young workers rights hub uh natalie thank you thank you thank you so much mayor thank you so much joseph and everyone else you've been you know it, it, it's a pleasure working with with, with with both of you you're like super supportive super chill super <laughs> like pro union pro workers rights it's it is extreme pressure working with all of you it's fantastic thank you so much for always <laughs> contacting ufcw it means a lot to us and it, it will can't wait can't wait for more to come can't wait that's right uh, it will continue natalie this yes was, yes this was really really terrific and i want to echo your shout out to Giselle. Uh, Giselle is, uh, has completed her studies at X University and she's heading off to grad school and uh, Giselle has been so critical and important to the launch of the hub, the work of the hub. Uh, Giselle, thank you, thank you. Uh, and you are muted, of course. <laughs> thank you, it's been a pleasure working with you, Meyer, and working with you, Natalie, I love the energy that we have, um, and I can't wait to see more young workers uh, being in, in all of your positions. Yeah. So I'll say to everyone, by way of closing, that uh, the Young Workers' Rights Hub continues. Um, we have a pretty super interesting uh, uh, and well-stocked uh, website that has lots of interesting material, including um, um, recordings of all of the previous sessions in this series. So Giselle has just put up the slide of our of our series. If you weren't, if you missed any of these sessions, including Natalie's uh, 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 opening day performance and, and uh, presentation, that is available. You can see the topics. They are all available on our website. Um, if you uh, um, uh, look for uh, the Young Workers' Rights Hub, uh, you will find us. There's lots of other interesting material there. We'll be back in September with, I'm sure, lots of interesting things. And I'm sure uh, more partnerships with uh, uh, Natalie and the UFCW. So um, greetings and best wishes to all. Thank you again for, for joining us and uh, to be continued. <laughs>